In the opening of the movie, we see a girl named Rana capturing a heartfelt video. She then approaches her friend named Janu, urging him to join her for a venture into the woods. She discloses her plan to create a special birthday surprise for her mother Dini, and assures that she's already informed her father about their plan. Upon the woman's insistence, the boy sighs and rushes off to get ready. However, their plan goes south. In the midst of heavy rain, they get separated and lost. Luckily Janu is able to return safely, but not Rana. The next day, we see all village people gather together, as the grim reality dawns upon them. Rana has vanished in the wilderness since the previous day. They all have gathered to go and look for her. Despite the collective efforts of her family and the villagers, Rana remains untraceable. Banyu, her father, clings to hope, expressing deep appreciation for the villagers' unwavering support and assistance. As time passes with no sign of Rana, the family is left with no other option, and thus they decide to hold her funeral rites. However, some villagers raise eyebrows over the timing of the ceremony, given that Rana's body hasn't been recovered. One villager brings up Miss Nur, a member of Rana's extended family, who makes astrological predictions regarding Rana's birth date, stirring up discussions about the ritual's rationale. Dini, Rana's mother, who is mourning outside, overhears them. As she sits there, she remembers when Rana had come to ask for permission to go. Tears run down her face as she curses herself for letting her go like that. If only she had refused then, Rana would be here now. Later, Banyu's sisters debate over whether to include the date of Rana's disappearance or the date when the search efforts ceased in the obituary. Sister Nur, however, expresses her objection. She unveils that Rana vanished on a Monday pawn, a day shrouded in superstition as the day of the deceased. According to folklore, those who disappear on this ominous day are said to meet a grim fate, with the earth swallowing them whole, marking it as their final day among the living. Ning proposes the idea of excluding the date of Rana's disappearance from the obituary. Upon hearing this, Rana's mother bristles with anger. She points out that Rana's body has not been recovered yet. Sri attempts to pacify the situation by asserting that fate is beyond human control. However, Dini challenges the notion of fate, questioning whose belief system they are adhering to. She questions the wisdom of giving up and wonders if surrendering to fate is truly the better option. In response, Nur reminds Dini of her earlier warning about the potential misfortune of letting Rana go on that fateful day. Nur accuses Dini of disregarding their beliefs, despite being aware of the consequences, implying that her recklessness has led to her daughter's disappearance. As if the poor woman wasn't already depressed enough, Dini, undeterred, defiantly declares that she will only believe if her daughter comes back alive. Tears well up in her eyes as she looks towards her other daughter Tari. Suddenly, a sharp knock reverberates through the room, jolting everyone from their thoughts. Dinny rushes to answer the door, her heart pounding with anticipation. To their utter amazement, standing on the threshold is none other than Rana herself. The poor woman is drenched from head to toe and looks miserable. After a week of going missing, she has finally found her way back home. Gasps of astonishment fill the air as they usher her inside, their minds struggling to comprehend the impossible. As Dinny tends to her daughter, Banya's sisters cautiously inquire him if anything seemed out of the ordinary, like Rana's feet not touching the ground. Banya's patience finally wears thin, and he erupts in frustration at their bewildering speculation. He dismisses it as the senility of their old age. Despite Nur's insistence on the accuracy of her calculations, Banyu implores for their solidarity and begs them to stop further complicating the already bewildering situation. For God's sake, their niece has returned home after being missing for seven days, and this is how they react. Just as Banya's sisters prepare to depart, a sudden sensation grips Nur, causing her to halt Ning in her tracks with a firm grasp of her hand. Meanwhile, Dini tasks Tari with fetching a towel for her sister. She tells him how her prayers have finally been answered. She asks Tari that now all of them have to make sure that Rana is safe and secure. Obligingly, Tari heads towards the bathroom, calling out to Rana. She keeps calling, but her cries are met with silence. Scared, she stoops to peer beneath the door, only to find the space vacant. All of a sudden, she is startled when Rana's serious face appears right before her eyes, looking back at her. Tari hurriedly moves back and asks her sister to stop playing such pranks when she opens the bathroom door. Rana, standing at the doorway, looks eerily silent. There is a strange aura about her from the moment she came back. Back in the kitchen, Dini asks her husband to buy some ramen, in case Rana gets hungry and wants some midnight snacks. Concern etches Banya's features as he suggests contacting a doctor first. He is still worried about his daughter's well-being and wants to have a thorough checkup done as soon as possible. However, Dini, reassured by her own assessment of Rana's well-being, 
adamantly opposes the idea. Banyu still insists, mindful of Nur's cautionary advice. He argues that they should be ready for everything, but Dini rebukes him, saying that all his family is going crazy because they blindly believe in the Primbin book a little too much. Primbin is a book that contains predictions about human life in the world, and it is quite famous within the Indonesian, especially Javanese people. The husband and wife get into a little argument, but then soon Dini starts to cry, and they decide to just leave the topic. Meanwhile, Tari, still reeling from the surreal shock, pours out her emotions to Rana, confessing her previous belief in Rana's demise and expressing overwhelming relief at her safe return. With a heartfelt apology hanging in the air, Tari shifts her focus to finding solace and sleep, hoping to shake off the lingering unease gripping her. As Tari begins to drift into slumber, an eerie sensation envelops her. She feels a strange hand embracing her from behind. Assuming it to be Rana, she asks her sister to join in a comforting moment, suggesting that she sing with her. The touch lingers briefly on her shoulder before retreating, leaving Tari with a peculiar sensation. When she gets no reply, she turns around to investigate only to find Rana peacefully asleep on her own bed. Poor scared Tari frowns thinking about what she just experienced. In the early light of dawn, after Banyu offers his prayers, he encounters Rana indulging in a morning meal of noodles. It is a familiar sight that brings a glimmer of normalcy to the bewildering situation. With genuine concern etched on his face, he asks Rana if she is hungry. He says that her favorite brand of noodles just released a new flavor, so he would get it for her from the market. He probes gently about her well-being, mentioning his arrangement with Dr. Addy to conduct a thorough examination. However, while talking, as he turns around to look, Banyu is met with empty air. It seems that Rana has gone away without him noticing. Perplexed and disoriented, Banyu mounts his bike, ready to depart. Unbeknownst to him, Rana has reappeared and is ominously standing behind him. Upon reaching the market, Banyu busies himself with setting up his shop, but his thoughts are consumed by the memory of the previous date, when Rana sought his permission to venture into the woods. Despite his warnings of the dangers lurking within, Rana had persistently pleaded, promising to assist him in his shop and accompany Janu. Eventually, swayed by her determination and assurances, Banyu relented, granting her consent. Now, seeing her strange behavior, he regrets his decision of letting her go. Finding him lost in thought, his brother-in-law named Basuki asks him about Rana and if she is alright. Upon hearing the messed up mental state of Rana, he attributes it to the atmosphere that his sisters create and how they believe in too much superstition. He says that perhaps their mindset rubbed off on her. Later that day, we see Tari, who approaches Janu. The man's demeanor betrays a sense of deep-seated fear, as Tari tells him the news of Rana's return. Bewildered by the revelation, Janu vehemently denies its plausibility and hastily flees the scene, his mind awash with disbelief. Meanwhile, Dini ventures to the market where she encounters curious onlookers eager to inquire about Rana's sudden reappearance. With a mix of relief and trepidation, Dini confirms her daughter's return and articulates her intention to procure ingredients for a celebratory meal in her honor. However, her moment of joy is swiftly overshadowed by the intrusive scrutiny of the townsfolk, who question the circumstances surrounding Rana's return, particularly on the night of the total ritual. Doubt creeps in, as one woman voices concerns about the authenticity of Rana's identity and warns Dini of the potential presence of malevolent spirits. Despite her attempts to deflect their probing inquiries, Dini finds herself growing increasingly distressed as the relentless questioning persists. Just then, Banyu arrives thankfully. In a bid to quell the mounting speculation and alleviate Dini's distress, he steps forward and says that they need not worry. Rana herself will come to the market tomorrow, and they can all witness her well-being firsthand. To quieten the crowd further, he asserts with unwavering determination that there is nothing amiss with Rana. The scene transitions to Nur's house, where Ning delicately arranges a plate of flowers, seeking her guidance on whether they're sufficient. She says that she would be putting them in Rana's room, and elucidates that the flowers serve as a protective measure. They would be protecting Rana from otherworldly entities. Nur looks at the plate, and then explains that if they wither rapidly, it could indicate that Rana is no longer human. With trembling hands, Ning cautiously enters Banyu's house through the back entrance, her apprehension palpable as she approaches Rana's room. As she stealthily slides the plate beneath Rana's bed, her heart skips a beat when Rana suddenly appears behind her. The girl flatly reminisces about Ning's past affection for braiding her hair, sending shivers down Ning's spine. Her face betrays her words. It is as if she is just a lifeless robot and nothing else. Overwhelmed with fear, Ning accepts the comb offered by Rana and nervously begins to comb her hair. 
Then, Rana implores Ning to recount the stories from the Primbin. She says that her aunt loved to tell her those stories, prompting Ning to reveal the book's assertion that Rana was born on a Saturday, imbuing her with a unique connection to the earth and a special status. However, as Ning rises to her feet, she recoils in horror at the sight of maggots infesting Rana's scalp, prompting her to flee in terror. Seeing her fleeing state, Rana smiles evilly, rushing to Sri. Ning recounts the ghastly encounter in Rana's room, describing the decaying flesh and writhing maggots she witnessed. Disturbed, she draws attention to the plaintive cuckoo's ceaseless lamenting outside Banyu's home since Rana's reappearance. It is a foreboding omen of demise. Though Sri acknowledges the eerie coincidence, she grapples with the paradox of witnessing Rana's physical presence. If she were truly deceased, how could they still see and talk to her? Just then, Basuki also arrives, confounded and fearful. Ning tells them that she put the tray of offerings under Rana's bed according to Nur's guidance. They just need to take it out and confirm her identity. Meanwhile, Janu seeks solace amidst the comforting aisles of a library, his unease still lingering. Suddenly, the tranquil ambience is shattered as the lights overhead begin to flicker erratically, casting eerie shadows. A chill runs down Janu's spine as he senses Rana's presence looming behind him. Slowly, she advances towards him, but when he whirls around, he finds himself alone. A moment later, a wave of terror washes over him as Rana materializes beside him, only to vanish into thin air before his disbelieving eyes. Terrified for his life, Janu takes to his heel. Later that fateful night, as Ning engrosses herself in reading, a sinister entity materializes nearby, its menacing presence palpable. Meanwhile, Sri, in the sanctity of her home, experiences a disturbing phenomenon as she begins to levitate, and a menacing entity grips her. Sensing an ominous presence, Nur awakens to the sound of barking dogs, her instincts urging her to investigate. Seated before a mirror, she is suddenly confronted by her own reflection, yet her attention is swiftly diverted by the chilling screams emanating from Ning's direction. In a desperate bid to protect her, Nur rushes to Ning's aid, imploring her to seek refuge in prayer and divine protection from the malevolent force that has gripped Rana. Simultaneously, Sri awakens from her harrowing ordeal to her husband's reassuring presence which offers a fleeting sense of solace amidst the chaos. The following day, Sri ventures to Banyu's residence, intent on inspecting the flowers placed beneath Rana's bed. To her horror, she discovers the vibrant blooms now wilted and lifeless, a grim alarm of impending danger. As she reaches to remove the plate, the sudden sound of the door creaking open startles her, plunging her deeper into horror. Panicked and disoriented, Sri makes a frantic attempt to flee, but her movements catch Banyu's attention. Before she can slip away unnoticed, Rana appears, clutching a tray of fresh flowers. This catches Sri off guard, and she wonders perhaps, in her panic, she saw wrong. With a bewildered expression, Sri watches as Rana approaches, requesting her to return the flowers to Ning. Sri obediently takes the tray and heads towards Ning's house, only to be startled by the roar of a passing motorcycle. This causes her to drop the plate that she was holding. To her horror, the once vibrant flowers now lay withered and lifeless a chilling transformation that stuns the scared woman. Meanwhile Banyu, in an attempt to lift the heavy atmosphere, indulges in light-hearted banter with Rana. However, his efforts are abruptly interrupted when he notices blood trickling from Rana's nose, prompting immediate concern. As Rana wipes her mouth, she discovers a wilted flower emerging. Making quick work of her hands, she hides this away from her father. Just then, the arrival of Dr. Addy interrupts the tense moment, prompting Banyu to welcome him inside. Introductions are made, and Dr. Addy proceeds to examine Rana, only to be met with shock when he detects the absence of a pulse. His examination takes a horrifying turn when he discovers maggots festering on Rana's decaying lips. This sight sends shivers down Addy's spine. With a grim demeanor, Dr. Addy reassures Banyu that there is nothing wrong with Rana. He then gets up to go to the washroom to settle his nerves. Just then, Nur and Ning arrive, and Nur urgently pulls Banyu aside indicating the pressing need for a private conversation. On the other hand, as Dr. Addy struggles to regain his composure, Rana's sudden appearance sends him into a frenzy of panic, prompting a desperate attempt to escape the unsettling scene. Yet, his terror only intensifies as he stumbles upon Rana seated calmly in the hall with her mother. Overwhelmed by the inexplicable events unfolding before him, Dr. Addy flees without uttering a single word, leaving behind a group of confused family members. Dinny, curious by the commotion outside, queries the group about the reason for their gathering. Nurse solemnly explains that Rana has unwittingly become a magnet for malevolent spirits, drawing them to their property like moths to a flame. As Dinny starts getting frustrated, 
Ming shows them the bowl filled with wilted flowers. Seeing this, the mother is even more enraged. She tells them against putting anything else in her home. Hearing all this, Nur takes Ning's hand, and they rush out of there after prompting a stern warning against the potential repercussions they may face. With a heavy heart, the duo reluctantly return to the sanctuary of their own home. There, Sri voices her concerns, recounting the string of strange occurrences that have plagued them, fearing a repeat of the tragedy that befell their mother. However, Basuki challenges their reliance on signs and the Primbin book over scientific reasoning, questioning the validity of their beliefs in the face of modern knowledge. Undeterred by Basuki's skepticism, Ning confronts him with a haunting reminder of the past, presenting a photograph of Bagas, their little son who passed away, as a stark testament to the consequences of forsaking tradition for science. Seeing her deceased son's name come up, Sri looks at Ning in disbelief. Emotions run high as Sri demands her sister to take her words back, while Basuki attempts to defuse the tension. The couple ultimately decides to depart, leaving behind a lingering sense of unease. The next morning, as Banyu prepares to head to work, Rana eagerly asks if she can accompany him, and together they make their way to the bustling market. However, this outing takes an unexpected turn, when some women in the market recoil in fear at the sight of Rana, deeming her a ghost. Their trepidation only deepens when they witness Rana seemingly appearing in multiple places simultaneously, leaving them stunned and bewildered. Yet, just as suddenly as she appeared, Rana materializes before them, further fueling their apprehension. Later, at her father's shop, Rana casually retrieves a piece of fish from the ground and begins to eat it raw. After she is back home, Dini imparts a valuable lesson to Rana, explaining Aunt Nur's belief in the tradition of making ketapot for those who have recently recovered from illness. She tells her daughter that she embraced their practices, yet still they refuse to be happy. When Rana asks, Dini instructs her on the art of crafting ketapat, fostering a heartwarming moment between mother and daughter. Poor Dini is unaware of the horrors that await her. On the other side, back at school, Tari seeks out Janu. She is puzzled by his avoidance of her the previous day and his continued absence in visiting Rana. Reaching his breaking point, Janu confides in Tari, revealing his exhaustion and fear of being tormented by Rana on a daily basis. He then tells her what happened on the day that Rana disappeared. He shoulders the blame for urging Rana to accompany him uphill, unaware that it was her cursed day, leading to the haunting events that ensued. The scene shifts to that fateful night, when Rana and Janu ventured into the woods amidst heavy rainfall. Janu recounts the harrowing experience to Tari, explaining how Rana vanished without a trace. He horrifyingly reveals that the girl in their house is not truly Rana, pointing to a book that elucidates the slim chances of survival for those lost in the woods, particularly after a week's time. He emphasizes the necessity of a cleansing ritual to ascertain the girl's true identity. After hearing all this, Tari remembers all the good times she spent with her sister and breaks down in tears. That night, Nur returns home in a state of fear, hastily securing the doors against the encroaching danger. Urgently, she tells all the others that they need to perform a cleansing ritual for Rana, warning of the malevolent spirits converging upon them. A sudden knock on the door sends tremors of fear through them all. Summoning his courage, Basaki answers the door only to be confronted with the shocking sight of none other than Rana herself. She is standing before them, bearing ketapat for her aunties. Basuki tentatively accepts the offering, but not without asking Rana if she would be willing to undergo a cleansing ceremony. After a moment of contemplation, Rana agrees, citing the Primbin's promise of purity following the ritual. Yet, she expresses confusion and frustration at the family's reluctance to believe her mother's words. With Rana's departure, Nur urges the family not to fear her but emphasizes the necessity of persuading Dini to agree to the cleansing ceremony. They gather before Dini, and Nur advocates for the ritual, stressing its importance. She also blames poor Dini for being the bearer of bad luck, and says that her birth date is cursed. She laments their ill-fated marriage, citing the mismatch of their birth dates as an omen of misfortune. Unbeknownst to them, Rana overhears this conversation from her room, her heart heavy with hurt. As Tari enters, she asks if she also hates her for coming back. Meanwhile, outside, an annoyed Dini voices her frustration at being judged as the harbinger of calamity since her arrival in the household. Despite her anguish, she staunchly defends her daughter, insisting that Rana should not be dragged into their discourse of misfortune. Nur accuses Dini that her family is paying the consequences of her ignorance. This angers the woman even further, and she lashes out. With venom dripping from her words, she questions what they would even know about being a woman, a wife, and a mother. She directs this stinging remark at the unmarried Ning. Ning's slap cuts through the tension, and chaos ensues, 
with each pointing a finger at the other. Amidst the turmoil, Banyu and Basuki attempt to defuse the escalating tension. Before departing, Nurse suggests conducting the cleansing ceremony the following day. After the tumultuous confrontation, Banyu implores Dini to accept the cleansing ritual, reasoning that if Rana is indeed alive, there is no cause for fear. Back inside the room, Tari is hugging Rana when her eyes land on the mirror before her. The poor woman is shaken to her core when she encounters a demonic visage of her sister. Meanwhile, Banyu's anguish deepens when he discovers a lifeless cuckoo outside his home, a poignant symbol of demise. Overwhelmed with grief, he breaks down in tears just like his crying wife inside. Back in her home, Nur is terrified when she sees a demonic Rana, who questions why she harbors such fear towards her. Maybe Rana should look in the mirror. The next day, Basuki stops Tari and Janu as they set out for the woods, questioning their intentions. Tari reveals the belief that performing the cleansing ceremony will lead them to find Rana's body. Despite Basuki's skepticism and insistence that the story remains unconfirmed, Tari remains resolute. She says that she is doing all this for Rana. Janu also echoes her sentiment, emphasizing that they need to rush. The children eventually go. As the cleansing ceremony commences, each member of Rana's family pours the ritual water over her, symbolizing purification. Seated on a chair, Rana submits to the ritual conducted. However, as the ceremony progresses, a sense of unease settles over the gathering, and Rana's discomfort becomes palpable. Simultaneously, in her own home, Rana's spirit finds herself surrounded by eerie menacing entities. Terror grips her as she witnesses them approach, her screams echoing through the house. Desperately, she attempts to flee from the malevolent entities, her panic escalating with each passing moment. Meanwhile, at the cleansing ceremony, spectral apparitions of elderly individuals and children begin to manifest around the participants, adding to the growing sense of dread. Back at home, a demonic spirit emerges from a nearby well, slithering its way towards Rana. One by one, the attendees at the purification ceremony fall prey to possession, their bodies succumbing to the influence of dark forces. Dini, unable to bear witness to her daughter's distress, implores them to halt the ceremony. Her heart wrenches at the sight of Rana's torment. Chaos reigns and fear grips the participants, and the ritual descends into a nightmare of terror and despair. In the depths of the woods, Tari and Janu traverse the eerie terrain, their nerves on edge. Despite sticking close together, all of a sudden, Tari finds herself alone. Meanwhile, Janu, disoriented by the cries of Tari, wildly searches for his companion. In a chilling twist, back at the ceremony, Rana appears in her demonic form. Simultaneously, Rana's original body, now rotten, appears before Tari. She is paralyzed with shock as Rana draws near, her terrifying presence overwhelming. Yet, her love for Rana overpowers, and as the rotten corpse hugs her, Tari hugs her back. As Janu approaches, he stumbles upon a devastating sight, Rana's lifeless body cradled in Tari's arms. Together, they carry her back to the site of the cleansing ceremony, where Banyu and Dini are shattered by the heartbreaking reality of their daughter's demise. The movie ends with a heartwarming video of Rana that she captured before passing away. The video message is addressed to her grieving mother. Despite her physical absence, Rana's words offer solace and reassurance. She expresses regret for being unable to present her mother with a special gift on her birthday due to the unfavorable weather conditions. Nevertheless, she says that her mother is the strongest and most resilient woman ever. Rana implores Dini to disregard the superstitions surrounding her birth date being cursed and urges her mother to hold onto the video as a reminder of their unbreakable bond.